set the recording. Welcome everyone. I'm really pleased to see so many new faces and so many familiar faces. It's great too, and names. Great to have you. If you like, when we do introductions, you can put your name, state, affiliation in the chat and just say hi. But this is the Go Open National Network entitled District OER Journey with State Level Support. I'm really excited to hear this conversation with our Go Open Michigan distinguished leaders about the efforts and the, the longstanding OER journey that's been going on in Michigan. This is our agenda. We'll do a little intro and I'll give you a sense of the Go Open Network if you're not familiar with it, just so everyone's on the same page and then we'll pass it to our guests. We'll have time for your questions and answers and time to discuss all these great things we'll be hearing and we'll have links and the slides to share afterwards. So why don't we do our, our intro? So I'll pass it to you first, Gina. Thank you, Amy. I am Gina Loveless. I am the Educational Technology Manager at the Michigan Department of Education. Um, I started my position almost five years ago as um, an Educational Technology Consultant that oversees our OER microsite, Go Open Michigan and a couple other um, projects around digital citizenship and just fun ed tech stuff. Teresa? Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Teresa Folk. I'm the Assistant Superintendent for Instructional Services for Wayland Union Schools. Um, if you're familiar with Michigan, we're about halfway between Grand Rapids and Kalamazoo. I am in, in my eighth year in this position. Um, prior to this, I have experience as a Director of Technology and Media Services, um, Building Administrator, um, technology coach and classroom teacher. So I'm really excited about this conversation. It's been great work that we've been involved with with MDE and excited to share our story. Great, thank you, both of you. And if anyone is just joining, you can put your your also your name, affiliation, and state um, in the chat if you like. And so I'm Amy Evans Godwin. I'm senior advisor at ISCME, a nonprofit based in Half Moon Bay, California. And for more than 20 years, we've been working in the OER space with the mission to make learning more equitable, open and participatory, especially through the use of OER. And we are the creators of OER Commons and have OER services and research about the impact of OER at all levels. And uh, we facilitate with our partners, the, the Go Open Network as really the the only organization dedicated to K-12 OER advancement. Just to give you a sense of the work that we do, we're a group of educators now. And prior to that, there was a, a long, wonderful period with the Department of Ed, Office of Ed Tech, OET, that, and that really led states and districts in a commitment to OER. Two years ago, they handed the reins to ISCME and a steering committee, and we developed a community model and a centralized hub on OER Commons, uh, a way of getting news to you and um, new opportunities for OER advancement and knowledge sharing. Last year was really a, a banner year for us around policy action and professional learning. We had a webinar at least every month and went to conferences and talked about K-12 OER and initiated a, a policy action to align with the issue of digital equity, that OER is a solution to be considered on the table when thinking of equity more generally and digital equity specifically. And going forward in the next few years, we're really looking at how to align with some other uh, initiatives that cross into K-12, like dual enrollment and things that like that, um, deeper learning, where learning is happening and how students are using OER um, with their teachers. So I'm gonna pass it now to Gina to tell us 
about your state efforts? So Michigan um, decided to open the, the Go Open uh, federal initiative back in 2016. Um, if you note that I've only been here five years, so they that was something that the department committed to before my position was created. So we started meeting with stakeholders around the state. We um, started planning on having a microsite, which opened up some doors and conversations with ISKME. Um, and the microsite did finally go live in 2018. Um, when I say stakeholders, I we reached far and wide. So we reached out to, we had some higher ed partners as part of our strategy planning committee. Um, we also had um, many of what we call in the state M groups. Um, and, and so all areas of education from superintendent to curriculum to technology, um, they all had a seat at the table during those strategic times. Um, and then we also, then obviously they dedicated a position, um, which I was fortunate to be hired in, in 2019. Um, and my goal, I think, as, as coming from the strategy team, I think the, the big, I did, I did say M groups, Kathy. <laughs> and those are just all the associations and they all start with M because we're in Michigan. Um, but this, after listening to the strategy team for a year or so, it was very obvious that as a group, we really wanted our microsite to be able to be used by any teacher, no matter what level, what content area, we wanted them to be able to go to Go Open Michigan and find resources that they could use in their classroom the very next day. And I thought that's, um, that's a great goal. And so that's why I kind of share it upon this slide. After 2019, I, and I came on board, we started um, doing some of that work getting more resources, things that were meaningful and high quality. That was something that was a real vision of the group. Um, and then of course, we all know the pandemic hit. And while that was, everyone panicked, I thought, oh, this is a good thing for OER because everyone started looking for digital resources. All the schools were closed. What do we do? How do we teach our students? Some were, some of our districts were one-to-one -one already. So they said, well, we take Chromebooks home and we continue our learning that way. Other districts weren't one-to-one. -one, um, and so they sent home um, education packets and worked on educating their students that way. But regardless of whichever way they chose to continue educating their students, OER was playing a part in that. We have um, a, a course that teachers can take about open educational resources. And like a lot of things during those first few months of the pandemic, there was a huge spike in teachers taking and passing our course on OER because they wanted to learn more about it. They kept hearing about it. So the pandemic, I think, actually put OER in the spotlight and Go Open Michigan was used um, incredibly a lot during that time. And we're seeing some of the fruits from the pandemic of what came to that. Um, we also, during the 2021 time, time period, just actually just before the pandemic, we added a computer science um, consultant. And so both of us were, were talking like, how do we get, you know, districts don't know what OER is and it's what's the difference between open licensing and um, and copyright. And so we were having a lot of those um, discussions. And she says, how do we implement new computer science standards with no money? Um, they're like, here, you do the computer science standards and, but, oh, sorry, we don't have any budget. So um, as we're going through all of this, we're, we're have this is all in the back of our minds as we're talking about that. But we know that when it comes to districts and funding had been cut in our districts year after year and not been supplemented, money talks. So we we knew that. And so we're, we're kind of keeping some of this information in the back of our mind. And eventually we created a competitive grant. Um, and I'm gonna get a little more into um, how we created that competitive grant in the next couple slides, but I'm just gonna and leave that there for now. So again, in 22-23, and even like right now, our competitive grant is open. 
Um, we shortened it because we work in the State Department, so everything has to be an acronym, of course. So it's our IET grant, and it's just um, the Improving Educational Technology. So um, that is open right now in our state. And there's two parts to the grant. So you can apply to implement and work at implementing computer science in your district, or you can apply for OER. Um, really, you can apply for both if you're really um, advantageous and really want to take on that work. But it is a lot of districts have learned that it's two separate implementations. It's hard to bring those two together especially in a district that's already tasked with a lot of work from their teachers. So um, so that's an ongoing conversation we have, like should we let them apply for both sides or should we just keep it together and let them choose? Because districts know what's best for that. So we've got the competitive grant. Um, we do a reorg from one year money to two year money. So when we first started our grant, we would get like, what they told us was the year two of Title IV funding. And so it was kind of like the Title IV funding within the department that nobody was using, but we'll give it to ed tech and we would take anything we could get. Um, but now with the popularity of this grant, they have said, we understand that it's easier for districts to have more time to spend that money. What a great idea. So now we it is a two-year grant. So we think that that's a lot more district friendly. Um, and I think, I mean, Teresa can definitely um, talk to that when, when she's getting ready here because she's been a recipient of that. So again, uh, keeping that money open enough to say the the districts know what they need to do, but also we're following implementation science. So trying to guide them a little bit in their implementation but not be too overbearing um, because we don't want to say, well, you have to do it this way because every district is different. So we want to, again, like I say, give them the freedom to go and explore and implement things the way they think that things need to be. Implemented. So now we'll go on to the special sauce. So um, the special sauce that we have to come up with this funding, um, let's talk Title IV. So Title IV monies, um, and this is a much better, easier conversation to have with state level folks because that's the pot of money that I am speaking from. So 95% of the Title IV money that we get from the feds goes right through the department and um, goes out to districts. Um, there are three areas of Title IV money. So I just wanted to kind of revisit that a little bit so that it's really clear that there's many different ways that Title IV money can be spent. And our Department of Ed chooses to spend it in all of those areas. So um, as you can see on this slide, the activities to support well-rounded educational opportunities, um, the safe and healthy students, and then the effective use of technology. So these happen to align really nicely with the way our department is um, kind of subdivided into different offices. So my office is the ed tech office. So as you can probably imagine, we, our office gets, um, our, our part of the department gets the activities to support effective use of technology. So that 5% that doesn't go out to the districts, there is, 1% that we use in our state for um, intermediate school district collaborative grants. And then the other 4% is divided into three different pots for each of the areas of our department um, to, to use at their discretion. Now, most of the money that is used within the department helps fund positions to support these activities. Um, we are lucky that in our area of the department, some of the money is used to support some positions, but there's a small chunk that is not, that was deemed to the ed tech unit to do with it, to put in statewide initiatives. So instead of just a bunch of more grants, because that takes manpower in districts to apply and go through that process, 
we decided that we would try to identify areas that we could support districts. So the, the small piece of so, small part of money that we get, we use in two ways. One for this competitive grant for computer science and OER. And then the rest of the money is used for statewide initiatives. So I think that next slide will tell us some of those statewide initiatives, just to give you kind of a taste for how we've used the ed tech money in the last few years. So some of the things that we have done, we've supported blended learning. We had a big micro, our Minecraft in education initiative in the state. Um, open educational resources, we still use some of the money to support that because there are some maintenance fees um, that come up yearly with that, the support of that. So we pay for those out of this money. Um, and the creation and integration of student level digital badges. Um, so this was something that had come up several years ago and this was, we said, well, you know, let's see what districts might have interest in that. And then our latest um, project that we're really digging into right now with some of our, our funding is computational things. So let me let me go through this quick, this Title IV grant. So we only have about $128,000, which in the world of money, legislative money, not a lot of money. Like how do you split up a small, the small pot of money around districts in the state to move computer science and OER forward? Well, we found out that Computer science has very special, special needs. Um, not only learning for teachers, but just money to buy robots or money to, to purchase things to help teach curriculum around computer science. So part of our grant dollars are spent toward, obviously, the computer science side of the grant. Districts can get up to $20,000. Um, their first year, and then $10,000 for their second and third years. Districts can apply three years. They don't have to be consecutive for that money. On the OER side, the first year districts can apply for $14,500. And then the second and third year, they can apply for $7,000. And this is really just, on the OER side, it's just really to support um, that first year is more money because we want districts to go out and see OER in action. So some districts have gone to other states. Some districts are going to districts within Michigan. Um, some districts are wanting to use the money for further professional learning around OER curriculum. Um, so we just think that this is a great use of the money. And so we want them to be able to know that they can use this money for travel. Um, and that was a really important piece because districts in Michigan had cut money so much that um, they weren't sure if they could afford, they, they stopped letting people travel as much. So now they've got the money, they can travel, they can go see these other districts in action and bring that information back and implement that into their own district for their implementation. So questions in the chat and I'll let, I believe, is Teresa the next one up? So yes, yes. I'm happy to answer more questions in if you have questions about that funding piece. Great, great. Thanks so much, Gina. I just know that Michigan really is leading the way to give funds directly to districts. I didn't realize it was 1% of the mm -hmm. Title IV. That's amazing. Well, uh, Teresa is going to lead us through her journey that started before this grant, a longstanding journey. So you're on, Teresa. All right, very good. So I have my timeline on the slide here starting in 2016, but I'll, I'll tell you that our journey to um, join the OER world really started um, quite a bit before that. In 2011, 2012, we made the decision to become a one-to-one -one iPad district. So that spring, we rolled out um, iPads to all of our teachers in grades 7 through 12. And they used those iPads all summer long, got used to them. And then in the fall of the 20 
2012-2013 school year, we rolled out iPads to every single student, grade 7 through 12, a device that they could take home with them and have with them all the time. So um, that really started our journey, even though we didn't really know what we were doing was called OER at the time. We were using sites like CK12 and Engage New York. Um, to, to pull content for students that they were accessing through their iPad. So um, fast forward to 2015-2016, we were a recipient of what was then called the TRIG grant, um, a, a state level grant, and we could use that for professional development. So we contracted with um, Apple at the time, and they came in and were doing some PD with some of our staff around um, our special education teachers and our social studies teachers were working together to take some of um, some books that our teachers had created in Apple iBooks and embed the teachers reading or the teachers going over vocabulary words. Um, and our, our special education teachers were embedding that right into the textbooks of the students with IEPs that, that needed those supports um, that then the students were accessing on their device just like any other student. So as luck would have it, um, somebody from MDE, her name was Michelle Rybant, she has since retired, um, she was visiting our school district while we were doing that work. And she said, hey, we're, we're getting ready to embark on this journey into OER, do you want to come along for the ride? And I had worked on some projects with Michelle before and had a very high level of trust. And so I said, yes, Michelle, let's let's do this. Let's let's go on this journey. So in 2016, 2017, um, when MDE signed on to go open, Wayland Union Schools um, signed on um, pretty close to that same time, we started joining a statewide strategic group. Um, I think that might be what Gina was referring to as that M group. It was our um, state level librarians and our technology groups and community colleges. Um, in terms of K-12 districts, Wayland was very, very involved right away. And then we had another district on the east side of the state that we collaborated with that was also really involved. Um, we learned, learned so much in that first year. Um, we presented at the Michigan OER Summit. At that time, the conversation around OER was really just occurring um, at the post-secondary level. Many of the attendees at that summit were community college representatives, um, but we were talking about K-12's involvement and kind of entrance onto the scene. And then we were lucky enough to be able to go to the Go Open Exchange in Anaheim, California that year and learn from other states um, what they were doing with, with Go Open and, and what it looked like in different places. So fast forward to the next year and really the theme over the next few years after that was really um, hitting the road and trying to empower educators and school districts from around the state with this information about what OER is, um, Michigan's effort, you heard Gina talk about the microsite, um, talking about how any teacher like Gina had, had mentioned could access that microsite and find content that aligned to Michigan standards was vetted by Michigan educators all on that site to really um, streamline and, and make the process of, of using OER less overwhelming for teachers. All of that work um, was done through that strategic statewide network where we had teams dedicated to curation and vetting and professional development. So it was just a very exciting, exciting group to be a part of. So we, um, Again, continuing on that trend of professional learning, traveled to the National Title I Conference the following year, um, presented at several local conferences and statewide conferences, just really spreading the word and teaching teachers about, about OER and all that it had to offer. Um, I have at the bottom there, all the way across the bottom, that whole time through our whole journey, it's a constant reinvestment in local PD and capacity building. There has not been a year <clears throat> since we started on this journey that we haven't invested in OER PD in some way, shape, or form. So you heard Gina talk about some of the grants um, through the state. That was definitely something that Wayland Union Schools took advantage of in um, the I want to say 2019. No, it must have been 2020, 2021. I grouped all those years because, you know, for those of us in in any capacity, really, um, those COVID years are a little bit of a blur. But when we came out of the pandemic, um, and I'll go back to that in just a minute, we were the recipient of one of those grants. And we traveled to a school district in Pennsylvania, Garnet Valley, who pre-pandemic had really organized a K-12 system utilizing almost 
all OER. And they had this housed in Schoology. And so the students who were brick and mortar students or the students who were um, learning virtually from home had the same experience all using those same OER resources organized in Schoology. And it was just very incredible. We, we learned a ton from that visit that was funded through those grants provided by MDE. Gina had mentioned um, when she was talking about in the pandemic and that shift to virtual learning, I give a lot of credit to, um, to our use of OER um, to continuing education through that pandemic. Our teachers who were already skilled and versed in using OER and our students who were already used to accessing their resources using their iPad, it was near seamless in terms of keeping education going. So just something that we were really proud of. Um, fast forward to the 22-23 school year. That was just last year. Um, we received another grant. Um, we attended the Open Up Resources Conference, the Hive Conference, and really focused on our, our math scores. Um, I don't know that I put this in one of our slides. I have some um, information about our student achievement data. And specifically around science and social studies, um, we have really seen an increase in our assessment scores and our student proficiency in science and social studies since we've implemented Open Up Resources um, because we've allowed our teachers to really um, focus on the standards that are high leverage and use the resources that, that best address those standards. Um, some other areas were seeing an increase, but a little bit slower increase. So you'll see me last year, we talked about um, that Hive conference, that Open Up Resources conference, focusing on secondary math. Um, we're applying again this year for the grant, hoping to get it. Um, we'll be submitting here pretty soon, Gina, um, to support our secondary language arts teachers in that same way. I see a question in the chat. Does the school with all the OER and Schoology share? Um, they might. So if you reach out to me, I think our contact information is at the end. I can hook you up with the people from Garnet Valley. They um, were, were amazing to work with and really we learned a lot from them. So that, that basically is our OER journey. On the next slide, Amy, if you can advance, I talk about um, where OER is in our schools now. Um, I will tell you, elementary um, has proven to be a, a little bit of a challenging place for OER. With our teachers having to plan for all content areas, we've just found that they, they just don't have the time to go out and explore resources. We do have some teachers using a Michigan grown solution for social studies, it's called the Giants curriculum. So we do have some teachers at the elementary using Giants, um, but, but that's really the extent of it for elementary. My middle school is nearly 100% OER. So we're using Giants for Social Studies along with the Michigan Open Book Project, which um, is a really neat project. Um, we had a group of people in the state of Michigan who um, worked together, teachers from each grade level to, to build digital textbooks that are aligned to our standards. Um, so we're using those. In science, we use something called the MyStar units. We're using Open Up Resources for Math. Commonlet 360, and then learning menus. I have an example of the learning menu um, in a couple slides, and it's really neat to look at. High school, same thing, open up resources for math, Michigan Open Book Project. Um, we have a lot of teacher-created OER at the high school level, Creative Commons, Unsplash, CK12 textbooks, and then learning menus. We want to go to the next slide. We've learned a lot of lessons since 2011, some of them good, some of them um, not so good, and I'll share some of those with you. Some of the good things we've learned about using OER, um, Giants is a, I'm going to go back to this question here, it's a Michigan created social studies curriculum that aligns to our Michigan social studies standards. So lessons that we've learned, when we turned the keys over to our teachers and said, you know, we're not going to do these large scale textbook purchases anymore. We've got these resources, high quality vetted resources. Let's look at them together, explore specifically at the secondary level. We had some teachers that got pretty excited. No longer was it a, we start the school year on page one and by the end of the school year, we have to get to page 899. 
they were really able to pick resources that met the needs of their students. Um, Pre-pandemic, we even got into the world of um, students creating OER. I have some really neat videos um, that some of our students created where they would go um, to our local grocery store and interact with people who were buying cereal, talking about surface area and volume of of um, cereal boxes and how which cereal box could hold the most cereal. And then using those videos to embed into units for students who took the class after them. Um, some of that, it's been hard to get started back again after the pandemic, but we are, we're getting back there. Um, deeper focus on the standards. Again, we all know when we are, are using some textbooks series, um, they don't necessarily go as deep um, on the standards as we need them to. Um, using OER has definitely allowed us to, um, to find resources that really, really um, are aligned to those standards. Our teachers were motivated. Um, I'll, I'll talk about this in a few slides too. The funds that we would have typically used on large scale textbook purchases, we're now reinvesting into our teachers. So I'm paying them stipends for the time they're spending curating and modifying and redesigning and developing their OER. And then again, taking this back to teachers being the true designers of learning instead of that race to get through every chapter in a textbook. So some of the, the not so great things that we've learned is, you know, we do have um, some teachers who, with that you get what you pay for mentality. If it's free, it can't possibly be good. Um, it wasn't created by, you know, experts. Um, so there's some hesitation around that. Um, many times, although this is changing, um, OER, it's, it's not put together in a neat package. So where you open up your boxes from a textbook publisher and you get your book and your assessments and your consumables and you unwrap everything and everything's in, in plastic and some of it gets used and some of it doesn't get used. Um, you don't have that with OER. And a lot of times you have to piece together and build what you want. Um, but, but even that has changed and evolved since we've entered this journey. And then again, you know, specifically for the elementary, um, just the abundance of OER, and it can be overwhelming vetting it all, you know, especially when you're teaching all subjects in a day. So some things that we um, found that were a little bit unexpected is, I, I referenced this earlier, like that lack of teacher confidence, like feeling that they weren't the expert in their content area. And so they didn't feel like they had the knowledge and skills necessary to pick resources that met the needs of their kids. So that's something that we've been working on. Again, that the conversations that we've had around your materials are not your curriculum. You know, it's you're not racing through a book in a year to cover your curriculum. Um, the time commitment, I already touched on that, um, the elementary versus secondary, our secondary staff who are teaching one or two subjects definitely have um, more capacity to dig into this and, and do this work. And then teacher empowerment, just again, really investing and, and building our teachers back up um, you know, in, a, in a world and society where we have not been kind to our educators for several years now, you know, that's, that's coming through in, in these conversations. This is a screenshot of, um, in the lower right-hand corner, I don't expect you to be able to read any of that, but one of our learning menus. So some of the things we've learned um, relate to those menus. And I'm gonna start with the bottom bullet first and work my way up. So OER um, for us is not an all or nothing. So in this learning menu, the different color coding um, are different types of resources. So one color is OER, like those are OER resources that we're, we're using. Another color comes from a, a textbook that we're using. And then the third color is a subscription resource. Like we subscribe to things like IXL and Magoosh, um, some of those different sites. So we have a couple teachers at our high school specifically who have meshed all of these resources together into these beautiful learning menus that our students can participate from. So as a student, if I am wanting to um, demonstrate proficiency in something, I have this menu with several different options utilizing a web of resources to do that. Um, with these menus and other resources that we've created, accessibility is a lesson that we've learned. Um, you know, we have to make sure that the, the materials that we're creating are accessible. Um, board approval for curriculum was a little bit of a difficult um, process to navigate. 
usually our process looks like anything that we're purchasing goes to our board of education to approve. But with OER, you're not necessarily purchasing anything. So what does that process look like when you're presenting to your board? of education. So something to keep in mind as you're um, navigating this journey. Um, Creative Commons licensing is um, something that we need to spend some more time with. We're, we've done a really good job at creating OER, um, but we haven't um, taken that, that leap to start putting it out there for the rest of the world to see. So definitely some lessons still, still that we have to continue to learn around Creative Commons licensing. And then last but not least, um, ownership. When a teacher invests all of this time and energy into creating, modifying, remixing OER, when they leave your district, who owns owns um, what was created if it wasn't put out there to share? So those are some of the conversations that we have had to navigate as we have moved through this journey. Last but not least, um, I have my little free puppy down there. It, so many times when school districts are looking to implement OER, they're like, oh, it's free. We're going to save so much money because we're not spending big money on, on textbooks. Well, the lesson that we've learned is that has to be reinvested. So reinvesting that into professional development for your teachers, compensating them for that curation, modification and creation, um, technology for delivery. It's not cheap to maintain a fleet of iPads with chargers and cases and cords. Um, so that's, we've reinvested our money there. And then you heard Gina talk about it and you heard um, me talk about some of our experience, but we are applying for every single grant that we can possibly leverage to support this work. So over the years, it's taken many forms, but in some way, shape or form, we've used Title I, II, III, for um, MDE's OER grant, and then of course, ESSER grants to support whether it was professional development, equipment, um, just various, various vehicles to support the work. That's fantastic, Teresa. You really covered so many of the issues of what it feels like for the classroom teacher to take on OER, and then where the decisions get made and how, uh, funds are allocated. So why don't we open it up for questions? And if you wanna put something in the chat or feel confident to just unmute and jump right into the conversation, I invite you to do that. While people are pulling their questions together, Teresa, what, do you have a sense of what percent of effort is needed uh, once some quality OER is selected? Is there a lot of effort on the part of teachers to do this remixing or to make it customized to their classroom? So we we had a large initial investment years ago in time for that that curation and remixing. I would say now our teachers ask for a couple hours um, every summer to, to do the work, but we're really in most areas at the secondary level in a maintenance zone um, where unless we're gonna do a big overhaul, we're, we're maintaining it. The requests are not as high as they used to be. Here we see a question come up. How do your teachers do with attribution? I'm talking about giving credit and perhaps the license notation that shows that they have what they have done is a derivative work rather than their own from Catherine. Sure. So our teachers who are um, really heavily invested in this work, we have trained them in using Creative Commons to give attribution for their work. What file formats are used from Dan? Google Docs? Yeah, Google Docs, um, PDFs. Um, we have some still on iBooks, a variety of formats. And here's where we are today. How are you incorporating AI from Tina? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I know that we're having the conversations around AI and both teacher and student use of AI. We have not merged the conversation of AI and OER yet. OK, 
Okay, uh, with follow up, and they give other authors attribution by name or name of org. Does that make sense? So it just you? depends on the Creative Commons licensing. Mm -hmm. Bridget, how are you navigating board approval and community buy-in when one of the key aspects of OER is the adaptation piece? Currently, the book ban and climate has escalated in our area, and there will be apprehension. Yeah, so we had um, a book challenge um, last year in our district that we successfully navigated. We took a pretty strong stand. Um, we used tools from ALA, and I'm trying to remember what or other organization, um, but we have a board policy that talks about how we handle um, book challenges. And so we used um, the practice that we have in place. We had a committee, the committee read the book, reviewed the book, and um, we came out pretty strong with our stance on book banning and knock on wood. Um, we have not had any issues since then. Um, I wouldn't anticipate with OER that being an issue. Um, we had some parent groups who were um, on Facebook, I'm not sure how they were even generating these lists, but generating these lists of questionable books and then searching our library inventory um, to see if we had those books. So some of the books that were brought up were not even books that the parents had read themselves, um, but yeah, successfully um, navigating that. Mm -hmm. um, not had any accusations of rewriting history. Yeah, this brings up two issues. Um, mm -hmm. Thanks, Bridget, for this question. Uh, there, uh, the adaptation piece, is there some question about empowering teachers uh, too much because that freedom may you know, lead to difficulty getting the material approved? So our conversations have really been around um, maintaining that alignment to the standards and keeping your resources that you're choosing um, really tightly aligned to your teaching objective, which is very tightly aligned to the standards. So we have not experienced pushback in that area at all. That's great. Great positioning on, on that. Uh, have librarians, school librarians, been involved with the OER process? Yes. Mm -hmm. Dan, have you done any translating into student first languages? We do not have a very large EL population. Um, so initially that was not part of our work. Our population of EL students is growing. Um, so that is an area that we're, we're looking at. We use a lot of the tools that are already embedded on the iPad to do that translation for us. Um, with, I forget what iOS update it was, you can literally take your iPad or your iPhone and scan, and it does the translation right for you. These are all great questions. Yeah, keep them coming. What um, what subjects uh, are you think are, are queued up for, for Whalen to create some more OER? Do you feel like um, maybe at the secondary level, you, you're ready to go with everything or there's still gaps? Sure. So our science and social studies, we're in a really good place um, with both of those. We're still having some struggles with math and language arts, just not quite happy with the scores um, that we're, that our students are, are achieving on, on our assessments. So constantly reevaluating um, the tight alignment to the standards, um, the the rigor to which we're providing us um, assignments and assessments. So we're still doing some work around both math and language arts at the secondary. Mm. Tina asked if you worked with teacher prep programs. No. And I'm not sure if that was a question for me. Um, okay. I know Tina as, and I think the the want is always there. Um, I know personally trying to get teacher pro pro programs all in one place to have that conversation has proven to be extremely difficult. Um, so if, yeah, if Tina, you have an in, by all means, um, we want to talk we are teacher prep programs. Yeah, OER training should be right in there with all teacher training. So at the state level, Gina, how are you continuing to build awareness 
in the K-12 space around OER? Because some recent report was that only maybe 28% of K-12 educators nationally have even heard of OER. That may be diff different in Michigan because you've been doing this so intentionally. Yeah, I, I find that interesting because while I think we feel that struggle as well, um, we have a, a course that teachers can get um, like continuing education credits through. It's um, for recertification, it's through Michigan Virtual. It's kind of that introductory, this is what OER is, this is how you might consider using these resources in your classroom. And honestly, this, we probably need to look at the course again to see if it if it's ready for some updating, but it is Michigan Virtual's number one course month after month that teachers are taking. So while over the course, like this course, I'm trying to remember what year this course started. So it was probably around 20, I'm going to say 2019, 2020 is when that course started. And we have statistics back to day one of when it went live um, of who signs up or how many sign up and how many complete. And um, we're still getting big numbers of completions. So it's, I don't think it's that teachers don't know about OER. I'm also, I'm starting to wonder if they're just waiting for their administration to start talking OER. And that's a, that's a difficult uh, thing to talk, to, to move forward because of all of the, um, I mean, we're getting new curriculum directors every year. It's just the, the turnover in some of these, um, areas and curriculum. I mean, I think Teresa can speak to this too. Like if a curriculum director, OER is not something like, oh, we can do this in a year or two. We can adapt this and get it moving. OER is the, the long haul. Like this is not something that you're going to say we're going to do for a couple of years and, and see all this wonderful, great stuff. You're going to see some wonderful stuff, but it's, you're in it for the long haul. This is not, not for the faint of heart. So I think that's where OER is a little intimidating at some of the district level, because it's hard to, for them to plan out five and 10 years. And people aren't staying in those positions that long. Yet. Without grants, how does the district sustain funding? I'll say I can answer this one. Um, for us, we have a set amount in our budget every year that we call textbook adoption money. Um, you know, during those really lean years of school financing, we trimmed down on that. But as we have worked to build back up, I've advocated for the rebuilding of that fund. Um, you know, it's not that we're not buying any textbooks at all, ever. If a textbook is a right solution for us, we will. But anything that we're not using on that textbook adoption, I reinvest into this OER process. How else could um, the state and district leaders um, collaborate to, <clears throat> to build the OER um, advancement uh, across the state? So I can speak um, to what we've done in Michigan. It really felt, um, you know, Gina had talked about the computer science consultant that they had hired. Um, I texted that person while she was talking because Gina actually stole her from our district. But during this OER journey, we really grew quite close, um, you know, working together with MDE, with people from Marysville schools, with school districts around the state, because we really worked to have a presence at every conference, every gathering where educators and administrators would be. So at, we have a McCall conference, or it's our state level technology conference, at literacy conferences, science conferences, we work to have that presence, whether it was one of us or like our, our state level Remsey representatives. Um, we, we did our best to get the word out anywhere where educators were gathered. It seems like one of the more final frontiers is sharing out after you, as an educator, do your work in, in your district and everyone's using it and happy. 
uh, but maybe it hasn't been shared across the state or you know with other states. What do you, what do you think about uh, that that area? Yeah, there is hesitation there. I mean, as educators, especially some of our teachers who have who are really really invested in this, um, we're perfectionists. So we don't want to put something out there that's not polished. That you know, I mentioned accessibility. Um, we don't want to mess up on our Creative Commons licensing. So that is our next step. Um, like really, really doing that thorough review, um, making sure we have our T's crossed and our I's dotted, and then sharing out. Let's see, any more questions out there? I could just keep asking forever because I love, <laughs> I'm so in love with what Michigan is doing to support districts directly in their work. Um, what For either of you, what do you think is uh, possible to make a difference in the, in the lower grades, the elementary space, uh, whether it's teachers not feeling confident or being overwhelmed or not knowing how to get started or um, how to improve in that area. So I'll give a shout out to Garnet Valley. One of the main takeaways um, that I had when we were at Garnet Valley, in addition to all of the OER work, was the number of instructional coaches um, that they were able to employ. So at the elementary level, they had instructional coaches for each content area. And their instructional coaches really um, led some of that work in, in finding the resources, modifying and preparing them for teachers. Um, they had committees where, you know, collectively they would review and discuss and change, but they, they really had a person at the elementary level who led that work. And it was just a very um, interesting structure. Um, their funding um, for that particular district is totally different than how Michigan funds schools, um, but, but very interesting. And then to see how they have been able to be successful with OER at the elementary school because of that structure. I'm also going to add, Amy, that don't think it takes millions of dollars to move the initiative forward in your state. I think that's what we're showing that even in small doses and while we're not, you know, awarding money to 30 and 40 districts a year, the, the three to 15 districts that we can award money to in a year, um, it's, it's making a difference there and it will, it's moving things forward. So we're, we're taking those slow steps, but we're still moving forward. So it doesn't take um, and, or, and we're doing it on what we feel like is pennies. So mm. it, it can do, you can do that. It's great to see that it's having an impact step by step. It's really, uh, it should be a model for every state to, to dip their toe in and get started. So we just have a couple more minutes. Happy to hear questions, but I put up uh, a way to get uh, more engaged with the Go Open Network. Happy to hear um, uh from you directly in email, you can go to the hub. Anyone could join, join the member group on the OER, hub, OER Commons Go Open Hub. We're on LinkedIn and have conversations as well as X slash Twitter. And our newsletter, it's going to keep you up to date. New resources. We have resources about AI and OER that are really super interesting, more every day are coming in and um, hope that you can continue to share knowledge on the benefits of OER uh, locally and nationally, because we really feel that this uh, community has uh, a way for lifting up educators across the country in this work. Thanks, Dan. Yeah, one-on-one -on -one and a real M LMS for elementary. Yeah, it's true got to put the tools in place. Thank you everyone for being here. We'll be sharing out the recording and the slides and hope to see you again. I'll put a plug in. Um, you have a chance to see Gina again in April, April 25th. Mark your date on the calendar and we will be sending out the details, but we're going to look at the National Educational Technology Plan with the Department of Ed, Office of Ed Tech, and CETA. They were the collaborative authors of this plan 
and what the uh, areas for addressing equity and how OER may be uh, part of this way of addressing equity across across education, across levels. So thank you, everyone. Yeah, thanks, Becky. Stay tuned for more. Thank you. Thank you, Teresa. Thank you, Gina. Great to hear from you. Thank you. Shout out to everybody, but Becky, I miss you, so. <laughs> I miss you too. <laughs> we'll talk. <laughs> Bye. Bye.